So uh, thanks for having me. Um, thanks for the kind introduction. Well, I, was, I have a great relationship with my 15-year-old daughter. Uh, I'm fortunate uh, that we're close. And I was talking to her yesterday about, you know, I had a chance to speak today. And she said, well, how long? And I said, well, they told me it was 60 minutes of prepared remarks and 30 minutes of Q&A. And she just started rolling laughing. Uh, why would anyone want to listen to you talk uh, for an hour? Um, and I, you know, I, I, thanks for the little confidence. And she's right. So, um, but I did. I've done my, done the best to prepare uh, some, I think, information that hopefully uh, you'll find uh, maybe provocative, um, eh, maybe somewhat entertaining. Hopefully, you'll learn something. Um, and if not, save the questions for Q and A, and I'll uh, hopefully be able to answer some questions. I. Um, this, uh, uh, it's a good group, so, so uh, thanks to all of you for coming. Thanks for skipping the afternoon lunch. I know that's hard, uh, especially at conferences. Um, if uh, you, you have a question as I'm going through the presentation, uh, interactive uh, presentation, presentations are always better, um, so raise your hand. If, I'm, if I don't see you, speak up. I won't be offended, and I'll stop and, and do my best to answer any questions that you have. Okay? So just a little bit. Um, about me. I, I've uh, been in uh, security, either security investing or security entrepreneurship for about the last, gosh, 16 years. I, I, um, I started my first cybersecurity company uh, back in 1999. Uh, you know, I've, had, I've been in a privileged position to actually watch uh, this industry evolve greatly you know, over that period of time uh, from the perspective of or many perspectives, either as an entrepreneur, or as an investor, as a uh, consultant. I've consulted to many companies that you, you would have heard of. Um, uh, and one of the things that I'll talk about today is that how, how uh, this, the ecosystem that, that um, you are operating in has changed uh, profoundly uh, for the better uh, for innovators uh, to take disruptive cybersecurity uh, products to market. Real quickly, has anybody heard of Mach 37? Okay, so um, thank you for coming. Um, for those of you that haven't, we're an accelerator. If you're not familiar with an accelerator model, uh, we invest. We invest very early uh, on in the life cycle of a company. Probably 60 to 70% of the companies that we invest in aren't even incorporated at the time that we engage. So we walk them through that process. Uh, the, uh, the whole premise of, of founding Mach 37 uh, for us was that there was a, a, uh, a richness the intellectual capital, particularly in this region, of, uh, of individuals that understood the threat, uh, more so than any place else, uh, we believe, uh, on the planet. Um, but what we weren't seeing is this um, ecosystem develop of this disruptive cybersecurity product companies that can uh, package that expertise, this advanced capability, into uh, a product uh, that can be uh, used uh, by uh, the rest of the world. Certainly this area, as I'm sure everyone knows, is uh, full of uh, cybersecurity experts that are uh, serving the intelligence community and DOD. Uh, but what we wanted to see was some of those same advanced defensive capabilities uh, get out and, and do some real good. So uh, over the next, oh, let, uh, real quick, uh, we invested in 22, uh, 22 companies since September of 2013. That's a pretty, uh, pretty uh, quick clip. Um, none of our companies have failed yet. Uh, that's better than most uh, accelerators uh, that, are, that we consider our peers. I expect uh, sometime within the next 12 months we'll have four to six get their Series A's, which is a, uh, also tracking better than most of our peers. So we feel really good about what we're doing. And I don't know if it's that we're exceptional accelerating, accelerating companies or that there's just this amazing rising tide, but you know, who, who am I to question? We're just going to keep doing what we're doing because it seems to be working pretty well. Uh, so over the next several, min several minutes, what I want to do is share some of my perspective on how the um, how this market has evolved. And for a uh, real quick question, anybody here have an idea or considered starting a business or maybe started a business before uh, for uh, a pr product company in particular? Okay, good. Um, so I'm going to share some uh, of my perspective on why it's better than ever uh, to do that. And um, for those of you who are considering uh, that journey, uh, some of the things that I, we think are critical uh, for you to address as, uh, as you go along the way. It isn't uh, as easy as stringing together some lines of code uh, that can work you know, in a bespoke integrated system that works for you know, government agency or you know, building something in the lab. 
to build a disruptive cybersecurity product, something that makes a real impact in the ecosystem, you gotta build a disruptive cybersecurity product company. And building companies is often, in particular for um, academics and for te technical founders, and in many cases, first time entrepreneurs, those are not skills that they've had a chance to exercise. So I'll talk uh, a little bit about uh, that as, as, we get, as we get through the um, presentation. Did it work? Okay. But first, just a quick look backwards. Um, so, uh, 2002, I quit. I quit the cyber, then the information uh, security, or the IT security market, I quit it. Uh, I can uh, remember saying more often than I care to admit, uh, this is really hard to do. Uh, there's no money in security. Um, back then, uh, the, the problems for the solutions that all of us, my fellow entrepreneurs and I were building, uh, we knew they existed, but the market didn't care. Uh, in 2002, the minimum standard of care and security was mostly antivirus and firewall. If you uh, were a little more advanced or larger and required for regulatory purposes, maybe you had a SIM or an IDS. But in general, um, uh, the minimum standard of care was you know, a couple of very simple things. Enterprise executives uh, essentially lived in ignorant bliss, believing the biggest risk that they were under was being out of compliance with whatever regulatory authority they were subject to. The market in 2002, the worldwide security market for information security software was you know, a relatively paltry 3.5 billion. I know that sounds like a big number. It's not. Um, it was dominated by five companies. Uh, Symantec, Network Associates, IBM, Trend Micro, and Checkpoint. Uh, over, the, over the last, over the period of time since 2002, uh, until recent, a uh, recent couple of years, I think we saw that most of these large platform companies that were dominating the space failed to integrate advanced capabilities uh, into their core products, into their platforms at an acceptable rate. Uh, if you think about it from just purely an economic or business sense, from their perspective anyway, um, in the short term, it made a ton of sense. I mean, why would you invest uh, precious capital in high-risk R&D efforts when you're already controlled more than 60% of the market. And even when you did introduce these advanced capabilities, all it was gonna do is obviate that cash machine that you had generating money for you. And so, um, you know, that, is, that was the ethos that uh, perpetuated throughout uh, the market. Um, for the smaller companies, or companies like I was starting back in 1999, it was really tough. It was really tough to get in. Even if um, I could offer uh, something that was better, they had no economic incentive to pay me. Uh, either as a channel or as my channel partner or as an acquirer um, to enter into their market and, and re to reach their customers. Um, I can recall one very specific incident in 2001 when I was invited out, uh, out to Palo, or out, actually Mountain View, uh, to present to uh, a, a one, of, one of the dominant players, not one that I mentioned, but a, a dominant player in, in, that, uh, you know, essentially had, had a virtual monopoly, mop, monopoly on issuing digital certificates. It, uh, I won't tell you the name, but it rhymes with AeroSign. Um, <laughs> so I, you know, we, we were young, and I had developed a really uh, interesting way, uh, let me take a step back. So at that time, what I, what I had done is it developed um, an SMTP gateway that managed all encryption operations, public key encryption operations. So think uh, difficult things to do in, in that scenario is uh, key discovery and revocation checking. And you know we had big vision, so we, uh, our view was this was gonna be, uh, require massive scale. And so we developed a way to do key discovery and revocation checking nearly instantaneously uh, on the scale of the internet itself. Uh, and so we went out there expecting that they, uh, this. A uh, giant player was really interested in what we had built and was interested in, in perhaps harnessing um, you know, the technology that we had built. And of course, we had dreams of you know, potential M&A. This was still before the, the bottom fell out of the market. And, uh, and what I rapidly uh, understood after being berated by a senior executive at VeriSign for about 10 to 15 minutes, my team and I, they invited us to come out there. Uh, how, how dare any... I'm, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but how dare a company as small as we are think that we could actually add any value to a market that they dominated. That was essentially the message that we got, and it was clear to me that they were more interested in developing defensive strategies to prevent themselves from being uh, disrupted, to prevent their, their uh, cash cow from being disrupted 
than they were at solving the real problem. Um, the point is, uh, of this backwards look, was that after the consolidation of our market in 2002, the market shifted away from innovation and more toward being competitive by dominating supply chains. It was more prevalent in endpoint probably than anywhere else, but the impact was that they had very little incentive to innovate, very little incentive to, uh, it's, you know, innovator's dilemma. Why innovate yourself? Uh, why disrupt your own cash cow? And so they didn't. Uh, and consequently, uh, our market suffered, our customers suffered. So since 2002, things have changed a lot. Uh, this is a, a little bit dated slide, and by 2014, uh, Gartner covered three times as many magic quadrants as they did in 2002. Uh, there are at least three more magic quadrants that have been entered in, uh, in the last year, uh, and Gartner, uh, in their hype cycle, covers many, many more. Um, according to Gartner analysts, in 2015, the worldwide uh, information security market will exceed $77 billion. That's a big number. Um, at an 8% growth rate, I think it's probably going to be a little higher than that. Um, today, investors are investing enthusiastically in, in startup or innovative companies in this space. In 2014 alone, there were 269 companies that got funded by venture and angel investors uh, at, a, at a clip of roughly $2 billion. Um, I'll, I'll show you a little more detail in a minute, uh, but M&A activity is up in our space and, and trading multiples are, are indicative of not only customers, but also investors demanding more innovation faster. So what changed? Uh, just the obvious, I'll get out of the way first. All of us know the threat continues to uh, improve and accelerate at a, at a rapid pace. Um, Cybercrime statistics. So uh, Cybercrime cyber statistics is a website, I think they said in 2014, 431 million adult victims uh, in 24 countries were impacted. Um, before, uh, I, you know, it seemed that uh, cyber criminals were uh, perfectly happy boiling the frog slowly, but, you know, this business has become much too big uh, to be ignored anymore, and the frog is jumping out of the pot, meaning um, consumers, regulators uh, are demanding solutions that work today, and enterprise executives that in the past had relied on strategies of sort of self-underwriting or, you know, firing the CISO, or my favorite is, you know, it's an advanced threat, you know, you really can't stop it. Those are strategies um, that don't work anymore. Second reason, the market's changed greatly. Internet of Things is exacerbating the problem. I think all of you here in this room probably know this better than I do. We have laptops, iPhones, wearables, gaming systems. Uh, the, the list is really limitless. Uh, many of these devices are either untrusted and interacting with your enterprise network, or they're mobile and interacting with, in untrusted environments. A uh, few of these mobile device or lighter weight devices have the computational horsepower to conduct advanced uh, security analytics that you might find on sort of a, you know, uh, a, a, a larger machine, a laptop or a desktop. Uh, IoT also impacts uh, physical systems more. Uh, Often these systems undergird our critical infrastructure and, and uh, the breach of which could cause a catastrophic effect, or in, which of course can cascade. However difficult the problem was in the past, it's continuing to get a lot worse because of IoT. My favorite, um, every one of us is impacted. We've all been imp impacted in the past, but now we finally realize it. Uh, Retail-related and government-related uh, breaches seem to be publicized on a nearly weekly basis that impact tens of millions of individuals. You know, like you, to get news on our space, I had to dig through dark reading or other trade periodicals. Now, you don't need to buy this. The New York Times, the Washington Post, Fox News, CNN, seemingly on a daily basis are continuing to, to uh, make this a main street issue. It's common in all mass media outlets. That's awesome. It's awesome for us. I mean, it's not only from a business perspective, from me personally, but it's awesome to be at the cocktail party and not be the lonely guy. People actually want to talk to us. I see you're nodding your head, right? Yeah. Um, they actually want to hear what we have to say because it, it wasn't FUD. It actually was happening. And perhaps the most important, uh, the market has is, is changed dramatically. Investors are rewarding the innovators. Um, 
as I mentioned, for many years, the security market was dominated by you know, the large incumbents. I'll call them the fat incumbents. Uh, they milked their antivirus cows, had very little incentive to innovate. Because of their supply chain dominance, new entrants had difficulty uh, demonstrating they could get to market, which caused them to have difficulty uh, getting the, the capital that they needed to be successful. Um, what the, the incumbents, the fat incumbents, what they failed to realize, what it, what, that it wasn't the small innovative companies that they were competing with. It was the adversary. And the adversary continued to evolve and innovate and innovate, and, and the, the fat incumbents did not. They did not keep up. And, you know, at one time when AV did work, it didn't work anymore, um, and their customers uh, grew impatient. Their customers grew impatient and turned toward the innovative companies and started buying from the innovators. And Wall Street followed shortly thereafter. Here's an example. You can see the innovative companies on the top. I only circled one or, or squared one on the bottom, but um, you know, Palo Alto Networks and FireEye did a really great job of breaking into the network appliance space. Uh, it was a, had a, um, it was a little bit less locked down from a su supply chain perspective uh, than Endpoint, uh, so it was easier for them to get in that way. But you can see uh, now they're both trading at incredible multiples. These are if, if anybody anybody have, I'll just tell you. Uh, from a financial perspective, a 17 times revenue multiple is, is uh, for our space, is ridiculous. I mean, it's great. Good for them, uh, and I'm glad they're being rewarded, but it is really high. And that just shows you how much uh, the, in the investor, the investors are favoring these innovative companies. Uh, by comparison, Symantec, you know, 2.3, that's, um, you know, slightly better than a, you know, really good systems integrator. Uh, but, you know, reflexive, or re it reflects um, the fact that uh, they failed to learn to innovate uh, over uh, recent history. So the, the takeaway is that it, it's a really good time to be an innovator in security. It's a really good time to be an entrepreneur in security. It's a really good time to be an investor in security. But as it is with any um, early stage technology market, timing matters. Um, CISOs are generally getting their, uh, you know, it, was it uh, last week at Black Hat, um, Dan Comiskey said, you know, this is him projecting, you know, CISOs budgets will double on average in the next year. And then they'll double again, and maybe double again, which is great, but he also uh, recognized one point. The reason that it has to keep doubling is because there's so much to do. Um, and understanding where the opportunities are going to be, um, which problems are going to be solved first, uh, could, will make the difference between success and failure as an innovator or an innovator that wants to be an entrepreneur. So uh, how do we, as investors in this space, look at it? And how, how uh, can you, as innovators, look at uh, our market as uh, you know, an opportunity or where, where you should put your efforts. Um, so I can't take credit for this framework. It's Sunil Yu. Some of you may know him. Sunil uh, um, is uh, a self-described mad scientist. He uh, is uh, responsible for only focusing on identifying the areas most critical for innovation for a very large financial services company that I've been told I can't mention. Um, Sunil admits that it's not a perfect model. Uh, but like uh, many good models in a, in a mostly, uh, well, in a mutually exclusive and mostly cumulatively exhaustive way, it helps us understand uh, essentially all the facets of uh, cybersecurity that we need to be focused on. There are at least two more dimensions that uh, Sunil has in his model. Um, you know, I would say I, I, I planned it this way, but the fact is I'm just not that good of an artist and I couldn't draw the two, di two dimensions uh, so that you could see it. But I think um, you, you'll get the point, uh, you know, with what I've uh, my feeble attempt to, to show his model here. Um, what I really like about it is, see, whoops, see if I can get this. Pre and post compromise. I think what he does is he demonstrates that there are certain um, uh, operational requirements of uh, a breach pr uh, pre and post compromise. And I think that's important uh, because as uh, the industry in general shifts toward um, a philosophy that we're going to be breached anyway. It will shift its emphasis uh, on investing in things like identifying lateral movement, 
making it uh, easier uh, or, or automating those things can, that can help identify uh, that an event actually is a breach before um, the crown jewels actually leave the castle. Um, the, the additional, or in addition to this line of demarcation, what I really like about it is, is it, it's not hard to, I keep hitting the wrong button, it's not hard uh, to really understand that our industry is going to shift away from products that actually uh, will uh, prevent the bad guy from getting in or even uh, from sort of this emergency response mentality. When we get hit, we'll go do something. When we get an event, we'll go respond. We're trying to get out in front of it and actually spending a lot more on analytics. The, the artifacts of a compromise are in your log data. You just have to know where the data are and what questions to ask and when. And you have to have uh, platforms that are sizable enough to sort through the data you have to find them. Um, and so those are uh, you know, important trends that we're seeing in this space that uh, if you're an innovator, will be important uh, for you to understand. Um, the analytical, the need for analysis, I think, is, is something that pervades a lot of the investments that we make. Um, and for a couple reasons. One, we recognize that we need it. But two, I mean, there just aren't very many of those people out there. Uh, that, uh, that human capital, it's a human, today, a labor-intensive um, activity. And there aren't enough uh, people that have been trained in intelligence analysis or people that understand how to dig a signal out of a high-noise environment. I mean, they come out of the intelligence community, which is a reason, one reason that we're in this region. Um, but there just aren't that many of them available. The good news is that creates a tremendous opportunity for innovators uh, to solve that problem. The other thing I like about Sunil, Sunil's model is that um, it really demonstrates the balance between people and technology as you move further right uh, in the, you know, sort of in the process uh, uh, today, um, act activities become more labor intensive. Uh, Sunil, I wish he was here to do this with me, but um, he's really skeptical about product solutions that really operate in this region. And I think that's where we actually part company because you know, I think it's healthy to be skeptical, but I also think that that's where we focus heavily on finding technical solutions or ways to deliver uh, these human capital intensive capabilities at scale so that not only large companies can spend less on them, but uh, profoundly impacts mid-sized and small-sized companies. Mid, mid and small-sized companies in, in these areas they're not even in the game. And we think that, that uh, if you can find a way to package those uh, advanced capabilities, either in technology or talk about it in a little bit as a service, um, then that gets them in the game and actually opens up the market. We think our market's growing fast now. When we solve those problems, it will grow much faster. So um, I mentioned we're in the business of, of making investments in innovation. Um, you know, we're not constrained by, you know, any uh, limited set of uh, investment thesis, but I, I will sh share four of them with you um, because I think it'll give you some insight into, you know, where uh, we think innovation is most needed. So the first uh, is, a, a, you know, first trend that's driving our first thesis is that, uh, uh, that there really is a need uh, to find a better balance between technology and, and people-intensive uh, solutions. Uh, we're driven by the recognition that the mid-market and small-sized companies have valuable intellectual property. Often it's the intellectual property that's, that's uh, owned by or important to their large company customers. They have PII. Uh, they have financial data. Um, they typically, as you know, represent easier targets or softer targets in their large company counterparts. And so they're the ones that, they're the attack surface. Uh, um, yet, uh, none of these are market or companies in this small to mid-sized market, which are important, have never been the focus of purveyors of our of product companies in our space. Yes, question. So as a service is a, uh, wow, you just really stole my punchline. That was awesome. No, no, that was good. Um, so, uh, well, let me get to that. And I'll, I'll uh, uh, thank you for the setup. 
Um, so what does that mean as an investor? Uh, what, you know, what it really means is that uh, we're focused on any of those technologies that are, are advanced capabilities that can be packaged in technology that can be delivered to in a delivery model um, that works for small to mid-sized customers uh, through channels, importantly through channels, um, or anything as a service. So threat intelligence as a service, log analytics as a service, identity as a service. Uh, those are important ones. Uh, it's a response management as a service. All of these are, all of these are things that uh, can be uh, delivered from the cloud as a service. It's interesting. I, um, so we, I had seen some of these in the past and, and uh, these ideas in the past and you know, even my own thinking at that time was really sort of large company, Fortune 100 focused. And my immediate response was, well, those big companies, oh, I didn't say that. Those companies don't want their data leaving their premise or their network. They, they don't want to put their data in the cloud. But you know what? For, for mid-sized companies, they're not that sensitive to that. It's a really a attractive, it's becoming increasingly attractive, certainly more attractive to them now than getting a call from the FBI saying, you know, you're, we found your data on, you know, an international server. Um, the as a service uh, delivery model uh, is the right way to go in this case. Uh, not only does it actually I enable the customer to buy uh, more cheaply and operate more cheaply, it also allows uh, the customer or the provider to take that, that rare intellectual capital, that human capital, analysts, um, and distribute them over multiple companies and gain economies of scale. Uh, and we think that that model works. We've invested in multiple companies that, that um, operate under that thesis. Um, you know, a couple things uh, about in embedded expertise or, or you know, making these things attractive um, to the mid-market. Um, and this probably applies more to, uh, than just the mid-market but large companies. So I come from a threat intelligence background and, and have learned a lot of lessons in that. I, come, I also was, uh, ran product management for a sim company, so I you know, sort of under, understand that. And, and what I've come to realize is that, you know, large company executives don't have a whole lot of appetite for um, tools that explore or, you know, analytical tools in general. Um, we know that uh, to analyze log data, to, to, to look for things that may not be there requires time and intellectual curiosity. And, and we know that sometimes getting the null answer, yep, I, I looked down this rat hole uh, and there was nothing there, is still success. Um, and that we know that, uh, but, well, we also know that the time that I spend going down this rat hole, I can't spend going down the 16 other ones that may be uh, more fruitful or, or may not. Um, the problem is that there's too many, uh, too many opportunities for an analyst uh, to explore that they just, they just can't keep up. What the CISOs want, they just want the answers. They, they simply want the answers. They want the, the risk-based recommendations of what you need to do. If it's low regret action, this is what we call inverting the analytical process. If it's low regret action, They'll take it if it doesn't cost me much, if there's uh, no significant impact to uptime, if my CEO is not going to be angry at me, if I'm not upsetting a customer, uh, they'll just take it. Um, if it's high regret action, then they'll start walking backwards through the analysis and the assumptions and check the veracity of it, rerun the analysis. And so we spend a lot of time investing in capabilities that do that, uh, that uh, use machines, not humans, to triage the data, come up with the, the 90 or 80 percent answer, and if it matters, then walk backwards. Uh, we think that uh, that creates significantly greater, a significantly greater impact that will not only uh, make it more affordable for large companies to do this, but also allow mid-sized companies to just get into the game. Next trend. So um, I, I know everybody here knows this, but I'll say it anyway. Perimeter solutions are, are not what they used to be. Um, most of us recognize that. Um, not only have we grown to recognize that uh, preventing a, an advanced threat from you know, getting through our perimeter is very difficult, Permit, preventing them from exfiltrating data is also extremely difficult, uh, but even worse than that, we have this unstoppable trend that a lot of our computing infrastructure is actually leaving the network perimeter anyway, uh, which is difficult to control. Uh, in the past, I think a lot of our in investments collectively were, we saw this around 2008, you really saw it, um, 
based on the premise that if I could just put sensor X at the edge of my perimeter, I could, I could stop threat Y and not really have to worry about what was going on inside my network or at my endpoints. Um, now, I think most of us realize that, that, you know, while there's value in that approach, it certainly isn't the panacea. Uh, we invest in zero things that recognize that uh, zero trust security models um, are appropriate. Um, if you're not familiar, it's not a, this isn't a new concept, by the way. Um, it just simply means that um, even with, uh, even with uh, hosts that are on the same network segment, I can't trust them. Uh, and if, if you start from that premise, then uh, you can start to look for uh, you know, things that look for lateral movement, for example, inside your network. Um, scalable solutions, so opportunities for investment or I innovation. Scalable solutions that can effectively identify anomalous behavior with, importantly, a high probability detection and a low false alarm rate uh, inside my network, we still need them. Uh, the false alarm rates vex everybody, um, and so you know, we in invest in a lot of that. Um, turns out uh, software-defined networking actually could uh, be a, a big catalyst for some of that, we've made one investment in a company that uh, focuses on that. If you think about the ability to use SDN to micro-segment your enterprise networks, which you can start to do, and inflexibly, um, flexibly segment them, um, you can start tightening up the distribution of what normal is. And if I have a very tight distribution of normal, then determining what abnormal is becomes a whole lot easier to do, and you gain a lot more confidence in, in taking action. Um, better uh, authorization. Uh, mechanisms, more scalable authorization mechanisms, things uh, that prevent super users. Uh, administrator super users are important. Uh, we've invested in, uh, you know, companies that are attribute-based access control and policy-based access control. Uh, we think that those are, uh, their time has come. Easy encryption, we've, been, we've made a lot of encryption investments post-Snowden for a lot, of, a lot of reasons. Some of them are related to Snowden, some of them not. Um, but making encryption easy and making it easy to implement right is, is a theme that we continue to invest in. Trend three, uh, next generation infrastructure creates next generation opportunities, IPv6, we talked about SDN, um, API calls, uh, or as a service, uh, de uh, delivery of code, um, all create opportunities uh, for security benefit. They also create uh, uh, different types of opportunities uh, for attack. Um, IPv6 related techniques, for example, um, it could be profound to threat intel. If you think about uh, IPv6 that, and the size of block lists, the way that we deliver block lists today, you can't do it with IPv6, there are just too many. Um, and so coming up with a new way to actually deliver that intelligence in, a, in an on-demand way is, uh, is sensible. Um, API calls, uh, we've invested in companies that, for example, make it, a, they have built uh, an authentic, authentication mechanism and uh, a, an encrypted data storage mechanism in the cloud uh, that it makes it really simple for uh, application developers to store their user data encrypted in the cloud or on premise, quite frankly. But it's as simple as making an API call, saves them months of development work, and they'll probably do it wrong anyway. Uh, SDN for ops, obfuscation, I think there's an opportunity uh, there uh, for software, to use software-defined networking to actually make, um, make to, to confuse hackers as they uh, try to move, move laterally within your network, and so we see opportunity uh, there. And the last one, uh, ubiquity of mobile platforms. We talked about IoT a little bit. Uh, we're making investments. It, it, it's going to be a problem at the endpoint to try to figure out um, whether or not um, whether or not uh, my host has been hacked. And so, doing behavioral analytics uh, on lightweight platforms is is an area of uh, uh, that uh, requires innovation. Uh, we've invested in one company in particular that actually uh, invests in a different approach. Instead of having a fat agent at the endpoint that asks all the questions all the time. Uh, much more sensible to take a, a micro agent, ask a simple question. If the result is anomalous, uh, in this case, just leave a digital pheromone and across the ecosystem, like ants would, um, attract other micro agents that ask a different question, a uh, confirmatory question. And so what you get is a much more efficient use of, of resources at the endpoint than you will with a, sort of a traditional agent model. Uh, and that's been demonstrated uh, in 
uh, in sort of traditional enterprise networks uh, to be much more efficient. So, as all of you know, this isn't, uh, this isn't sharing economy stuff. This is, a, is not my quote. This is a quote of a, a friend of mine, Bob Ackerman. Bob's uh, uh, the founder of Allegis Capital, has been an investor in, in uh, several very successful security companies, one of, the, you know, one of the smartest investors in our space that I know. Um, and he's right. When people ask us what kind of entrepreneurs that we invest in, we, uh, I typically say, well, look for, I look for entrepreneurs or teams of entrepreneurs that, that embody two characteristics. One is deep security, technology, and analysis or analysis uh, domain expertise uh, born from years of, of um, experience. And the other is uh, the softer side of, of business, uh, someone that has good communication skills, someone that uh, understands sales and marketing, uh, perhaps is an extrovert. Um, but as an accelerator, we invest as, as early in, in the life cycle of a, company, of a company as you can. And quite often, we get, uh, we get teams that are super small, one person, one founder uh, that we like. Um, and quite often, that founder only embodies one of those characteristics. And more often than not, the characteristics that that founder embodies are the characteristics, oops, the characteristics on this side. And that's totally cool with us. The um, dirty little secret in startupdom is that all those character, all those things on the right, a technical founder can either learn borrow, hire, acquire um, in a reasonably short period of time. Technical founders did all the hard work. Um, you know, anybody here, you guys maybe have heard of Amit Yaran? So, sure. Right. In your presentation, can really use this fancy word like I don't know, I IR, IR and so on. Yeah, yeah. You go like, oh, but we do like signature less malware detection or something. And yeah. you go like, what? So don't you think that maybe an accelerator phase is not important, but then just get more and more important? I think it's not important for you to get uh, for you to get into an accelerator. I do think it's important for you to understand that, um, which is, you know, I'll, I'll tell you what we do at Mach 37. We imbue our technical founders, our first-time entrepreneurs, with a vision for their business uh, for the next six weeks, the next six months, all the way through exit, so that it will inspire a series, well, importantly, inspire a co-founder to join you, and then inspire Series A or seed investors to give you capital. Uh, so absolutely right. You have to be able to talk the talk at some point. Um, the reason I brought up Amit Yaran, he's a friend, uh, and, and one of the most successful entrepreneurs in, in our space, certainly in this region, um, he founded, uh, founded NetWitness, founded RipTech before that, exited both. He didn't invent NetWitness. It was, uh, you know, a, a team of, of technical found, techn technologists in the bowels of a company that were acquired by Mantech that actually in, came up with the concept and did the work. I'm looking for those guys. Um, and those guys are, if they go through an accelerator program, are going to get to keep the prime cut. Uh, they're the ones that did the hard work. The rest of it... Uh, we, you, you, know, you can find in a co-founder that's looking for you, something that you've done. We've had, um, you know, we're about to have significant success with this model uh, with an investment that we've made. Uh, some of you may know Sam Small. Um, he, he really does come, he comes from this community. He's, um, uh, you know, was a protege of Abby Rubin. Somebody that we knew uh, couldn't articulate, uh, to your point, couldn't really articulate what he wanted to do or the value proposition or how he was going to get the IRR. And we really, Mach 37, we sort of, we're patient. And we know where the opportunities are. And we, uh, we listened to him and sort of finished his sentences for him to help him articulate it better. But we made the investment in him because we knew he was really on to something. Um, let's see. OK. So Mach 37, we start with uh, deep technical domain expertise, and we wrap uh, around a lot of skill sets, uh, a lot of capability around those entrepreneurs to make them uh, successful. 
the first starts with imbuing our, our founders with a, a deep understanding of the importance of product management. Uh, but there aren't that many product managers in this region. A lot of them are uh, in, you know, mostly in the West Coast in Boston, uh, which is why we really focus heavily on it because it's something that, that until they can recruit one, we'll have to, they have to know how to do it on their own. And it's, a good product manager always knows that you start with answering this question first. Why would anyone want to buy uh, this capability? Um, it's important for two reasons. The first reason is it's likely a technical founder actually built this thing in order to solve a problem that he was having or she was having at work. Or you know, maybe they got paid uh, by a, a government agency to, to research this particular uh, project, but uh, more often than not, with technical founders that, that we invest in, they haven't taken an opportunity to take a step back and look and ask questions. Do people actually have the problem I'm trying to, I'm trying to solve? The second one is uh, perhaps even more important for technical founders that have never been in sales, that never had to sell something. Um, and you know, in that regard, I'm going to paraphrase this in about 20 seconds, but uh, I highly recommend reading Simon Sinek. If you haven't, uh, he, he, uh, his book is called Start With Why. It's a really great book for first-time entrepreneurs. Um, people buy things to fill emotional needs. Uh, you know, I suppose in our space that there are some folks that uh, in the sim space that really got uh, excited about the fact that you know, we can massively parallel process a query or that um, you know, I lay data to d down to disk in a certain way that makes uh, doing analytics faster. But in general, people buy products because they want to see their families more. They want to do things faster and better and get out of the office uh, just, like, just like you do. Uh, you see this every day uh, in a security operations center, an event occurs, and then you know, a, a, you know, a cascade series of, of, of complicated uh, analyses ensue. And the guy, that the security analyst that has to do them, he's the one that's screwed. Um, and I saw this importantly in the sim when I was running product management for a sim company. Uh, and I had a great SE, and I was I was uh, there meeting with a customer, a healthcare, a large healthcare provider uh, with the security operations analyst, uh, SOC man, uh, SOC analyst. And my SE was saying, well, it's really awesome, and we, all the data is stored there, and you can you know run this SQL function and this SQL function, and you can normalize the data this way. And, and when he got finished describing what what uh, could be done after an IDS alert of a certain type, you know I could see that this analyst's face was turning red. First of all, he wasn't a SQL expert, and he didn't want to do all that work. But second of all, he's just thinking, okay, what you've just given me is a product that's going to cause me to do more work instead of less work. And that's where, in general, we failed in the security business. We haven't realized that software, security software, needs to be delivered in a way that makes people's lives easier. So, good product manager understands that his or her biases are, are um, nearly irrelevant. Same is true for the founder, the same is true for the CEO, the chairman of the board. The only, really the only opinions that matter are those of the individuals that are likely to buy your product. In order to find out what their opinions are, you got to get out, got to get out of the lab, got to get out of the office. Um, you know, getting those opinions is, is an iterative journey. Um, oops. Requires you to beforehand to do a couple of things. One, you have to understand where that particular audience, where this prospective customer is going to place you um, in the market. You have to understand what your competitive environment is like. They will always ask you for the reference. Okay, how are you like X and different than Y? And if you don't know that, it's not going to be a meaningful conversation. Uh, you need to be able to articulate concisely your value proposition. This is really hard. Um, you know, uh, this is mostly a technical group, right? really hard for you guys to do that because I know that you're, you're focused, you're in the weeds and, and, and perhaps your competitive advantage of whatever you're working on is, is nuanced, but at the end of the day, you've got to find that balance between, you know, helping me understand how this gets me home earlier and why you're uh, competitively advantaged. Interview with, with, armed with those answers, interview at least 10 people uh, before you start writing code. Uh, we, 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 we get this a lot. Um, 
I get a lot of applications for people that have, uh, first of all, they're under the fallacy that if they build the thing and then and they can sell it, uh, then they can go raise money after that. Never happens that way. You're always going to have to raise money ahead of time. Uh, uh, but uh, they, they always are focused on, te technical founders are almost always focused on building things because that's what they love doing, and I understand that. Um, much better to go out and talk to the prospective buyers to make sure that the thing you're building is, is um, you know, what they want to buy. Uh, often I get applications for people that are like, I got this thing and I just want you to help me get my first five or six, uh, you know, beta customers. It's a milestone. It's important to get, you know, your seed round done. And of course we do help them do that, but yeah, you know, that's, they just did it backwards and we get, we get that a lot. Um, technical founders are, uh, not particularly good. I would say almost said notoriously bad, but I won't, it's not that strong. Uh, at, at seeking feedback. Uh, maybe they're introverts, maybe they're um, intellectually arrogant, maybe they just don't want to hear bad news, maybe they don't care. Um, it's hard to know, uh, but for whatever reason, they, they, uh, we have to encourage them to get out and talk to prospective customers before they start you know, building that next version of the product. Yeah, I made this mistake in a, in a big way, the first startup that I did back in, in 1999. I spent $2 million worth of my investors' money uh, building, you know, SMTP Encryption Gateway. And, uh, you know, and we thought we were pretty smart at the time and thought through, well, geez, you know, this is the killer app. Email is the killer app. And, and you know, all, every enterprise is adopting email and all their sensitive corporate, you know, either IP or sensitive information is going through this, this medium. And, we know that it's out, of, and now we know, really know, later on that, of course, it was um, very easy to collect at certain points of the internet, and that they wouldn't want that to be the case. So email encryption would be uh, ubiquitous, and and even to this day, that that wasn't true. But that's not that's not the takeaway. The takeaway is, if I had just actually taken my own advice and gone out and talked to ten CIOs, I would have known that email encryption was number ten on the list of things that they wanted to buy. And it was going to be 10 on the list for the next decade. And I would have not been in the business that I was in. And so it, the, uh, and all this is about product management. When you're, when you're out having those 10 meetings, it isn't an opportunity to sell. And don't, you know, don't feel like, in fact, you shouldn't be salesy. You, you know, ask the question and then shut up and listen to your customers. Product management is an opportunity to prevent you from making a very expensive mistake or a series of mi expensive mistakes. When you learn that the market isn't what you think it was, was or that your product shouldn't do what you thought it should do, that's success at this stage of your enterprise. Congratulations. Um, too often, uh, we do things uh, backwards. Know your competition, very similar to shortcomings in product management. How much time do I have, by the way? Okay, good. I'll get through this. Um, know your competition. Uh, again, same reasons that uh, perhaps technical founders lack uh, perhaps the acumen or, or the desire to do product management. They often lack the desire to just look at the competitive environment. We're interested in building things, and, and we, won't, we don't take the opportunity to take a look out into the environment and see what else has been built. Really important as you're, as you're building your product for a couple reasons. One, when you're defining what your MVP is, focus on those features in your MVP that really highlight competitive advantages that other people don't do well. You know, don't, don't build something that somebody else has already built. We see that a lot. Um, focus on the thing that you can do for a customer that doesn't have access to that thing today. And so uh, knowing where your competition is and knowing what they're delivering uh, is very important. Um, perhaps equally important and just more, more practical is that when you go out to get your seed round or you go out to, importantly, if you go out to get your Series A round, your investors are going to ask you for that competitive analysis. And, and so the way that this goes down is um, on Friday afternoon, much like the, the, the security analyst in the SOC, the, uh, the junior associate at the VC firm on Friday afternoon gets told by the managing director, hey, we're going, to make, we're going to bring this up at our meeting on Monday to make a decision. I need this competitive analysis done. You need to tell me <laughs> where they fit 
in the market. And of course, you know, he's got plans to go out with his fiance that evening, just like everybody else does. Give it to him. Give him the competitive analysis, it's thorough, and helps that, uh, that security, or sorry, that, uh, that venture capital associate, you know, do his job for him. Uh, show him how you're competitively positioned, where you're focused, how you differ, differ from the competitor. Um, and, and then things will go a lot better for you. Um, and one thing's for sure, if, you're, if your investors are aware of a significant competitor in your space that, uh, that you're not aware of, that will dramatically shake their confidence uh, in you and, and your ability to get money. Uh, everyone know what, what a minimal viable product? Everyone heard of that? Okay, I won't uh, go into great detail about that, but uh, I will say just make it easy. Make it easy to use. Um, you know, just got a uh, couple of questions. One, just one quick anecdote. Um, your MVP, uh, your user experience is much more than just UI. UI is the thing that sizzles and the thing that people buy. But if your product isn't easy to install, uh, easy to upgrade, easy to buy, easy to replace, then that will impact the entire user experience. Uh, make your MVP uh, very easy to use. And, and uh, if the UI, the UI that you've built isn't just abundantly, it's not abundantly obvious to the customer um, how they should use it and how they could you know, get the value out of it, then rebuild it. Um, that will become increasingly important as, as you know, the market trends toward the mid-market and, and smaller businesses and even in the consumer market. Software needs to be consumerized. Uh, today, so UI, UI, UI does matter. UX does matter. Um, I failed at this too. Um, it was a couple years ago. Uh, I was working in a threat intelligence company. We had just made a, you know, a, a big sale to uh, a large financial services company. This was in August, September timeframe of 2013. You guys remember when the sort of the first big DDoS attacks started occurring? And so it was a courtesy call. We were in there, and, and uh, the, the team that we had sold the threat intelligence product to came in, and, and they seemed tired and anxious, and, and they wouldn't really tell us what was going on. But what they said was, well, they, they sort of got around to you know, asking the question, well, how do, we make, how do we use this to solve our problem? And I said, well, what questions do you want to ask it? And they said, well, what do you want to... Uh, and then I said, well, what do you want to know? And they said, well, what can we ask it? And we said, well, what do you want to know? And... and uh, so a couple of things happened, and, and, and it's really common in our, in our space. Uh, you know, we failed. Uh, you know, it, before that, we failed because we didn't build a product that the customer knew how to use. We did a really good job selling it, selling it to the customer. Uh, we did a really crappy job making it easy for them to use. So um, I did what a lot of companies that, that you're familiar with do when they build bad software. I, said, okay, well, well, on Monday, I'll have two of our analysts up here working with you um, to answer uh, the questions that you want. And we did, and it cost us money, and, and we did it at our, you know, our expense. And what we were able to do is work with them side by side and deliver the value and give them great insights. They've done some really provocative things uh, because uh, we did that for them. And, and ultimately, we, we built those uh, new features because the product wasn't built to do that. Shame on us. Uh, we, we put those new features in, uh, and then they, well, the good news is, is that within a couple of, within about a month, they gave us another lucrative contract to buy more analysts, so that was good. Um, but then they, they, uh, they bought more of the software because the product roadmap had that capability that they needed. We solved the problem for them. Uh, we should have done it before we sold them the first copy. Question. They didn't, did they? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Um, you're right. They may not need sliced bread. Not everybody does. Um, and that's, uh, you just pair of sort of, you know, encapsulated um, what happens all the time. And I'll, um, there's, so salespeople think they know. They probably don't have, in most cases, the tech, technical acumen to really communicate in a way that needs to be communicated. This is, they, yeah, oh man. Uh, good salespeople listen. Uh, good product managers always listen. That's their job. Um, there are, uh, you know, I, I think the two most important jobs of any software company, I'll talk about this in a minute, uh, product management at the center of mass of a software business, any product business, uh, and SEs. SEs are the ones that are worth their weight in gold. I can have, you know, five or six salespeople, and, and forgive me if any of you are salespeople, but they're a little bit of, except the really good ones, a dime a dozen. Good SEs, really hard to find uh, when you find them. That's absolutely right. Um, just a, um, perhaps an epilogue uh, to the story. So in addition to sending those analysts up to New York, um, they actually sent us a bunch of data. Actually, technically, they gave us access to, uh, to their data from where we were in Maryland. And I ripped out a bunch of guys. And this is a no-no in software development, by the way. I, I took a bunch of our developers, and I just threw them at this problem because it, we couldn't afford to lose this customer. Um, and they were, excuse my French, they were pissed. I mean, it's, you know, they were in the middle of their, uh, of their two-week sprint and, you know, getting home at a reasonable hour. And, and I just gave them a bunch of work to do. Um, and it was, I mean, it was kind of simple work, but it was looking at the, it's fundamentally looking at the intersection of threat intelligence that we had and the history of that and um, online banking login logs and uh, NetFlow data. And, you know, and I asked them, taught him what a histogram was, and I said, okay, we'll put it in this format so we can take a look and just start asking questions. These are the questions that I want you to ask. And, and it, it, the really telling part was, and, you know, that whole um, perspective changed from just being angry to feeling awesome because I came in the next morning and, and one, of, one of my senior developers who was perhaps the most vocal complainer, Rick, Rick, you gotta look what I found. This was awesome and I, and I, I can't really tell, well, Okay. So what he found was, from a very specific set of threats, um, you know, at the height of the DDoS, where there was just a ton going on and a lot of noise, what he found was a 10 sigma increase of a certain kind of attempt uh, to get through, uh, you know, through the VPN into a certain part of the network and then disappear. And for another week, the exact same thing later, which gave us some, you know, a little more indication of what the, you know, what, what was really going on. Um, that's not the importance of the story. The importance of the story was that, the important takeaway was that because I, <laughs> I had a better developer after that. You know, he understood why, why we were building what we were building. Um, and, you know, we should have started that way. We just, we failed to, uh, because everybody does. Um, you fail to make, make the connection of why people want to buy what you're building. I talked a little bit about this already. Uh, building a prototype is more than, or I'm sorry, building a product is more than just building a prototype. A lot of technical founders, founders will, will do that. If you, uh, how many people work for systems integrators or work um, in, anybody? Okay, you'll see that a lot in, in this region where you have one customer, you build something. It's, you know, often code's a little bit like spaghetti, uh, not professionally built. Um, prototypes are typically spaghetti code. They've been thrown together to, to demonstrate a certain capability. They're almost always rebuilt. Um, <laughs> that's right. Well, um, if you have good engineering management. You know, technical debt's a whole nother. Uh, there is a time to address it in it. You know, there are always business constraints. And, you know, I've lived on both sides of that. Um, you know, focus on... Uh, Everyone wants to ignore QA. Everyone wants to ignore DevOps. You want to get the prototype type out as early as you can in, in the, in the uh, maturity of your business. Build those things in. It's a lot cheaper to do DevOps these days uh, than it used to be. Uh, it's a lot cheaper to have good development infrastructure um, than it used to be. You don't need to go get a major seed round in order to start you know, having disciplined uh, development processes. 
make sure you do that early. Uh, importantly, this is uh, why I think that's really important. When you get money, you're going to start hiring more developers. Uh, and I'll show you sort of you know, who you hire when in a second. But you're going to hire more developers. You want them to be productive. You don't want, uh, you know, if you haven't, you know, if, if you don't have any documentation and your software's uh, not modular and, you know, you're not uh, making it easy to integrate uh, pieces of your software into other pieces of your software, it's very difficult to bring in a new team member to your development team and make them productive on day one or, you know, day 30. Um, so build infrastructure that actually allows for that. You're building companies. You won't be a three or four person company very long. Okay, real quickly, um, build a business plan. Uh, best business plans that I've read are eight to 10 pages. They're, they're uh, always thorough, but very concise. I say eight to 10 pages. Sometimes they're 80 pages, but 72 of those pages are in backup. Uh, you know, when we run our entrepreneurs through our 14-week program, they end up with the, the full complement of things, uh, questions that they'll need to, to be able to answer. And each of those questions sort of, uh, you know, takes the form of a, a PowerPoint slide. Uh, and most of those end up in the back. Um, Communicating your value proposition doesn't take that long. Uh, communicating value proposition to an investor really doesn't take that long. Um, but when they start to go into due diligence, if they realize you haven't addressed uh, something that they would expect you to address, then you'll shake their confidence. The word familiar up there is really super important. Uh, I'll talk about this in financial models in a second, but also in business plans. The whole point of it is to, is to demonstrate to an investor that you have a vision for your business that will be high growth, high margin, and give them the return that they expect to get. And so we teach all of our companies this. Now, there are lots of different ways to build a business. Not all of our companies will be venture funded. All of our companies are, are taught how to get venture funded, but sometimes they'll have uh, really attractive strategic, strategic off ramps, opportunities to be acquired early, and sometimes that works for them. And luckily, we're in early enough, that works for us too. Um, a little bit about uh, the stages, uh, the five stages that we teach. Well, Mike, whoops, sorry. Microseed, uh, typically you're focused on concept validation and prototype development. Uh, most of your investment, most of your, your uh, spending will be uh, in, in the engineering side. Market validation and seed stage, market validation and target customer traction. Uh, seed stage, what you should expect to have is by the end of it, uh, you know, good beta. Good beta product, maybe uh, you know uh, something a little further along. Uh, customers that you're in your, in your target market, that's in a, a large addressable market, that are saying, "Yeah, I liked it. I want more of it." And I've bought, or I'm willing. Well, at this at the, by the end of seed, you need to have customers that are willing to buy, that are paying you. Series A, it's when you start getting, you know, you start to see the uptick in valuations here from, you know, let's say under five million to, you know, ten to fifteen. Um, Series A funding anywhere between, well, used to be three to five, now it's five to ten, sometimes bigger, you know, I don't, there's a whole flight of venture in, into, toward uh, this space, so it's been really great for the entrepreneurs. Um, you focus on building scalable infrastructure, what you, so, how do I want to say this, um, think of a Series A company as a model, a, a complete two-scale model of a larger company. And by the end of your Series A, you will have QA processes, you'll have your development processes in place. You will be able to demonstrate at a small scale that I'm able to deliver um, to customers in a repeatable way with high quality software or whatever the product might be. And then I have, uh, with limited investment in marketing and limited investment in sales, think three to four salespeople, I'm, I can show that we can sell this product. And what you want your investor to think by the end of the Series A is that all I need is more cash. And generally, when you get your Series B, which is, of course, somewhere between a 10 to 30 million, maybe 40 million dollars in funding coming into the company, and you see a big uptick in valuation through Series B, um, it's where you're throwing gas in the fire. You're really spinning up marketing, which is probably, you know, really scalable uh, resource. You know, you put a little bit of marketing in, marketing in you can get a pretty good return um, with, uh, you know, your funnel will increase greatly. Um, and then follow-on rounds, you know, a lot of guys will exit after Series B. A lot of follow-on rounds are just, you know, to continue the hockey stick up um, to reach a valuation that gives you the return on investment you want um, or make acquisitions. Financial models. Anybody built a financial model here? 
I spent some time on Wall Street. This is therapy for me. And, you know, I, I overdo them. Uh, that's a mistake. Don't spend too much time on your financial model. There are um, a couple reasons that you need a financial model. One, you need to know how you're going to uh, spend your capital. Or, and you also need to know how much capital you're going to need. And you're going to need to know when you're going to need to get it. And all of this needs to fit within the model that an uh, investor is familiar with. I start, it's iterative. Um, Start with human capital plan and a budget, what I think my company is going to look like. Then I try to figure out uh, how I'm going to acquire my customers, which will I, I'll derive revenue. I'll talk about how you uh, different revenue models and how they work in just one second. Um, my human capital plan and, and then add uh, marketing and sales uh, to that. Um, you know, what is, what is my operating profit? How does that generate cash? Or in most cases, for the first several years, how much cash am I burning? When am I out of money? And what are my investment requirements? And remember, when, uh, so and that tells you how much money you need to actually implement the plan. How much cash do I need to go raise? And then you need to decide when you want to raise the cash. And you, you, uh, a couple things to remember. Um, you want to make sure that your revenue or your, your, you've hit the milestones that you want to hit to get you the valuation that you want. Because every time you raise money, you're giving your company away or part of it away. It's dilutive. Um, and so you want to minimize that if you can. Uh, I would caution you not to be too dilution sensitive, especially if you're a first timer. Uh, worry about that the next time. Uh, you're, um, so uh, don't be too dil dilution sensitive uh, and figure out, uh, okay, I can hit this milestone here, I'll, I'll raise this much money here, and that will allow me to hit my, my second set of milestones and get the Series A that I want. Uh, and then if I raise more capital, this, I need this much capital to get to the Series B uh, threshold for revenue that I want. The um, one rule. Uh, that I want you to remember if you ever do this. Always raise the money at least six months before you need it. Uh, investors can't help themselves. They're, you know, you, th you think that they're your friends, and they are. I have lots of investors that put money in me, and they're, they're still my friends. But they are going to smell the blood in the water. If you're out of cash, they're going to know it, and they're going to just they're gonna get the deal that they want and not the deal that you want. Uh, so always raise money six months ahead of when you need it. Um, the way to not get a bad deal when you're raising money is to have the option to say no. Um, here's an unplanned anecdote. So I uh, learned this from Anoop Ghosh. I don't know if any of you guys know Anoop. was a DARPA PM. Now he's the CEO and founder of Invencia. I uh, really had the privilege to help him uh, start his company. I mean, this literally was Rick. I got he's flipping burgers in his on his grill and his friend. I got this idea. I want you to help me with. And it was his first time. He'd never started a company before, and I, I had done uh, one. And, and I said, well, sure, I'll help. Um, and what I learned from Anoop was this. Uh, because he, he, he did a really good job of, of finding alternative non-dilutive capital into his company. So he was, you know, DARPA funded a lot of research that, that Invencia was doing. And what that allowed Anoop to do when he went to raise his money, because he had cash flow coming from that thing, is to say, no, nah, I don't like that deal. I think I'm just going to stay small. Because he, he, he was going to eat. And his people were going to eat, and you know, and the investors were like, "What do you mean you're not going to take all your?" So no, I'll just I'm fine. So he really managed that cash flow very well from this sort of alternative source, and it and it gave him the leverage to walk away and say, "I don't like that deal," and he called their bluff, and they of course gave him a, a great valuation. A uh, really smart guy, a good friend. I have a plan to build a team. Technical founders are not good at this. Um, anybody consultant? I've been a consultant. Anybody been a consultant? If anybody's been an independent consultant, this will be something that you struggle with. Um, you've been really good at doing all the work for yourself and being paid handsomely to do so. Um, and, when, uh, and that is a recipe for disaster if you're building a product company. There's way too much work to do. Um, you have a good idea if you're a technical founder, well, if you're any kind of founder, uh, start with a co-founder, somebody you trust. It's a marriage. You don't want to have to unwind this. Uh, somebody that you really trust, and importantly, somebody that outworks you. Somebody that you know that will, when you're tired, I mean, it's just anybody exercise, you know, running buddy, I hate getting up in the morning, but if I, if my wife's getting up, you know, she'll drag me out, and I feel, you know, I'm grateful that she does so. Um, you know, find that person to partner with, because you're, it's just, this is a marathon, it's hard, you don't want to do it alone, you want somebody sharing the stress with you. So start with a good co-founder, somebody that has complementary skills. If you're technical, find somebody that is good at, you know, sales or marketing or charismatic or knows how to, you know, is artistic or whatever that other, those skills you don't have, find that person as a co-founder and do it early. Um, and then have a plan to build the rest of your team. Uh, let's see. 
real quickly, just sort of you know where uh, where I think that you're gonna uh, be spending your focus. You s still the same five stages. In Microseed, your focus or, uh, of, the, of the human capital that you'll be investing in is mostly product development, a little bit of sales. You're doing the sales. Your co-founder is doing the sales. One of you is doing development. Maybe you hire one more developer or two more developers, depending on how much you can afford. Um, you get into seed. Let's see. Product development again. A little bit, a little bit different. Uh, you're maturing your product development ecosystem. At that point, you've developed a uh, prototype. You're getting it into uh, in environments. You've got a beta product that you're ready to sell. You may be investing some into marketing. PR is a really good place to start. Um, good trick that has worked for me in the past is uh, investing it at right here, investing a little in PR to add a little bit of luster to the company as I go to raise my Series A. If your name shows up in the media, that will add 20% to your valuation in the eyes of a VC means that they, you know, and it, it's rational. Uh, they know that you know that part of the business and that you know how to get, um, you know, uh, some traction in the media. Um, series A, you'll focus on building that infrastructure, sort of finishing the model uh, at small scale. Series B, you're focused on ramping it up. You know, this will be the, the predominant uh, focus of hiring at this stage. And following around varies, but it could be anything. And, and adding strategic acquisitions there is pretty typical. Pricing and customer acquisition, I'll, I'll just real quickly go over that. Um, sometimes this is, you know, this is hard for a lot of people, and, I, and it's not, I'm not really sure why. Maybe it's because they're bad at product management. But there's some, um, some decisions you got to make about how you're getting your product to market and how you're going to generate revenue. How you're going to deliver the product? Is it on-prem software? Is it an appliance? Is it as a service, some sort of hybrid? Um, are you going channel or direct? You know, is it a VAR model, or OEM model, model? Am I an app that's, uh, you know, online marketplace? What's my pricing structure? It used to be everything was perpetual license with, you know, 20% maintenance fees annually. That's changed. Then we went to subscription license. Freemiums are, if you, if you use Splunk and got hooked on Splunk and the freemium model, that was really well executed by them. Now people are upset that they pay too much, but it worked for them. Utility pricing is something we like uh, because it allows small to medium-sized enterprises to, uh, to pay for only what they need at a cost that they can afford, and then as they grow, then, then pay for more. I, I think that's really disruptive pricing, and that was enabled by uh, cloud, and a lot of our guys use cloud. Um, but this is really easy if you did product management, because as you had those conversations with those prospective customers, you're going to learn how, okay, not only are you going to learn what they want to buy, you're going to learn how they're used to buying it. What do you most like? How do they? How much do they pay for that? Are you are you, you know, more valuable than that? Less valuable than that? Uh, fractionally, you know how much they want to pay, and then they know how how they want to buy it. And it becomes really academic at that point. And just real quickly, one last comment about the model. Um, the important thing is, is that it demonstrates to your investors that you know how to grow this business. You're going to hire other people that know how to grow the business better than you. If you do your job right, you're going to hire you know, really professional managers. Well, actually, one comment that I, I failed to mention around building a team. Um, the people that you hire at the very beginning of, of an enterprise are utility infielders. You're, you know, you are all wearing different hats. You're all doing multiple things. Everybody's selling. Um, you're all downfield blocking. I'm mixing as many metaphors in here as I can. Um, as you start to move through Series A and Series B, what you're going to start doing is, is paying for the very best position players you can afford in those, uh, in those roles. You're, and world-class organizations are, are built with world, individuals that do world-class things and specific things. Um, sometimes, and actually almost all the time, uh, as you're growing, there isn't room for the utility infielder as you grow. That's OK. Uh, it is all part of growing that business. Uh, you know, sometimes that happens, and it's something you should expect as, as founders. Okay, uh, back to this slide. Gross margins have to exceed 80%. Has anybody done? Okay. No one's done systems integration or government contracting work? Yeah. Anybody? Well, if anyone, is anyone, if you're not familiar with DCA audit, good. Uh, you know, if you have an accountant that says because you're doing government work, you have to, you know, use uh, account, like government contractor accounting formulas and they can pass a DEA audit. If they say that to you, fire them. I did. 
and an accountant. Uh, we're a software company. We have software financials. I want uh, the difference will be if you look like a government contractor, eight times revenue. Do you want to exit at max two times revenue, or do you want to exit at ten? And it, and it is dramatically different. And, and if you have uh, a controller or a, an auditor or an accountant that actually is trying to sort of bucket you in that list, you've got the wrong person. Uh, find someone that understands you know, software and product businesses. Um, accept the fact that your models will be wrong. They're not intended to be right. You don't have to add one. one uh, so should have thought of this. I had one entrepreneur that we invested in that was a risk person. This uh, individual actually automates the calculation of risk based on, you know, threat indicate, threat changes this way and my risk to my enterprise changes this way. It's really awesome stuff. Um, and so what he built his model and he started putting in all the assumptions, these um, uh, Monte Carlo, just, or he ran a Monte Carlo simulation on these distributions. I'm like, <laughs> really? And, you know, and it occurred to me, well, I wonder why he did it. And it occurred to me, he just didn't want to be wrong. So if he put the distribution in there that captured both extremes, he wouldn't be wrong. And to be able to point to the investor and say, well, you know, I didn't really say that. You know, that's not the whole point of it. The point isn't being right. The point is having a tool to actually run your business and know how you're going to grow it and communicate that to an investor. They will hold you accountable. Your investors are going to cut your projections in half anyway because they know there's hyperbole involved. Um, the way they hold you accountable is if you continue to build the business and if, if you fail to continue to grow the business or build the business, then, you know, obvious happens. Um, last point. Models really tell you when you're going to run out of cash. Never, 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 never run out of cash. That's the num number one rule of entrepreneurship, never run out of cash. Um, the one thing that I know is true about every startup company, the successful startup company I've been involved with, is that they stayed in business long enough to get lucky. And if they told you that they weren't, that luck wasn't involved, then they're, they're lying. You got to stay in business long enough. You got to maintain your cash flow long enough to have a little bit of luck. Um, it's funny how that happens every time. I won't go into this in too great detail. Um, this is the financial services. Uh, I'm sorry, the um, it's a K1, the annual report from a company that all of you know of. Um, they show 93% annual growth year to year. You're going to show that as you build your model. 70% gross margin. They, uh, they got a little bit hammered uh, on this. This is because they made a huge acquisition of a services company, and it brought down their margins. Um, sales and marketing, see this, 103% revenue. This is how you grow. Um, the market at, at this point in time was perfectly fine with that. They're starting to you know, hold them more accountable today. Anyway, the financials are different. If you were a, a DCA auditor, you'd have... ODCs, your gross margins wouldn't be, in this case, 70%. They'd be about 20%. And, you, you know, there's, you're not, at that point, not the right kind of company. Last point, uh, and thank you all for attention so far. The last point is just about selling. Um, the, uh, for the same reason that I think they have shortcomings in, in product management, uh, Technical founders in particular have a difficult time selling. Um, I, of course, they'd rather be developing the next line of code or in the lab. Um, but the good news about selling is it's more of a science than it is an art. And we teach it that way. Um, you uh, set up a product, just like you would for a you know, product management cycle, set up uh, you know, your sales management process exactly the same way, weekly. Weekly, you'll, with your co-founder and whoever else is helping you do this, you'll go through your funnel. Every, everybody know what a funnel, sales funnel might be? Anybody not know what a sales funnel is? Okay. So it's a metaphor. Um, and the sales, uh, sales will be broken down into, into multiple stages. The, you know, when you, you put your leads at the top, and generally leads are generated by either inbound uh, calls or I'm at a trade show or maybe I have an uh, inside sales force and we're, you know, we're making calls and getting touches. You want to uh, then, as you uh, qualify that lead, you move it to the next layer of the funnel, and as you move uh, a little further down, maybe you're in contract negotiation, second meeting, um, and then uh, you know final close. And it's just it's a metaphor that um, all all good sales organizations use, um, except for uh, well, so unsuccessful ones don't. Uh, make sure that even when when you're uh, very early on, you're continuing to build uh, those layers of the sales funnel and you're holding yourselves accountable uh, to, okay, this is where we are. Why is it stuck here? How do I move it down? Or maybe it, it's time to give up on that one, but how do I move it from 
lead to qualified lead and from qualified lead to end negotiation, what do I need to do next? And, and develop very concrete action items um, every week uh, and hold each other accountable for, for meeting those. Um, a couple things about first time entrepreneurs, you may not have the credibility that you need to actually get the leads. Uh, so some things that we teach, pursue seek, uh, speaking engagements in, in, um, at uh, events that are relevant to your business. Uh, they almost always prevent you from being salesy. They don't want a bunch of sales pitches uh, at most of the events that you would speak at, and that's fine. What you're doing is establishing your credibility so that at some point later when you put in a call, they'll take it because they know what, you know what you're talking about. Uh, borrow credibility. We, uh, we build advisory boards for all of our entrepreneurs. Uh, we've got a large mentor network of about 200 uh, industry execs that all want our companies to be successful. And so they uh, align with our companies and our companies will leverage their credibility and say, well, you know, uh, and LinkedIn's a great thing because you can see who they know uh, and, and you can ask, well, please make this introduction to me or can, can, you, can you get me to this individual or can you um, help me have the conversation? Product management, the product management stage is a, is a good time to have that. It's not sort of not salesy. You're not pushing, you're asking and learning. Um, leverage your advisors, your investors and your board members that way. Uh, one, Anybody ever build an advisory board? Okay, um, here's my advice. Uh, I'll see if you shake your head up or down. If early on, if your advisors aren't leading you directly to customers or investors, then you don't need them. If you're gonna, if you're gonna give these individuals significant equity in your business, and it's, you know, we a average about half a percent, quarter percent you know, per advisor, uh, in the company that they're helping. Um, that's real. That's real economic benefit to them. If they're not earning it, don't be ashamed to say that it's over. Um, but I think importantly, uh, we have to disabuse uh, um, many of our technical founders of this unrealistic expectation that, you know what, I'm going to go do this, focus on building this awesome product, sliced bread, and, um, and it's going to sell itself, or I'll be able to go just go set, focus on raising capital from investors because I like that. Um, and then I'm going to get that money and go hire the sales guy. It never works that way. First of all, you can't get the sales guy you want until the really good sales person, until uh, you can show that sales person that it's really easy to sell that product. You don't get the you don't get the A players until it's just you know until you don't need an A player. Honestly, it's funny. Um, but the one thing uh, it's really important to know is that if if we, we can't get our technical founders over that hump where they get comfortable with that sales process and, and leading the charge, at least early on, they're going to end up with steak knives or, or less. Everybody see Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross? Okay. If you haven't seen it, you got to see it. I think that's it. Did I run over time? Yeah. Yeah, ah, sorry. Uh, any questions? Okay. Can I take one question? Yeah. Okay. There's still only 10 minutes left. Awesome. Do you want to use the mic? Or, like, can I ask you to do it? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I'll repeat it for you. One of the biggest issues I think usually helping people is making it easy to say, well, we're in a market size. Like, yep. We never mention the CRM. So. We do. Um, uh, I didn't mention it in the slides. It is understanding the market. It's so funny. This is a, it's a, it's a truly academic exercise. B2B. Uh, so think of like Slack, for example, messaging yep. uh, app for B2B. Yep. So I was wondering how would they do to pitch, like say, okay, how many, like we're building an app, and it's going to be used by you know, like, end developers, right? Yeah. So how do we know how many developers are in the market? So um, it's funny. I have uh, a couple of, so I don't remember precisely how they did their market sizing. So I have two investments that are really similar to that. One, actually, one, one's encrypted Slack, actually, an investment that we made. Another was uh, uh, actually two other ones that are focused on marketing to developers. One is um, they essentially uh, uh, rewrote uh, encryption libraries. And the other is encryption in the cloud, right? API call. Uh, and so they're, uh, the whole market of address, so they've sized how many developers they think there are in the world. And then, which is a, a little bit interesting. It's we know it's a big number, uh, and so the the um, 
that starts as their you know potential addressable market and how much you can make from those is you know it's a tough number to come to really come to and they used a couple of uh, proxies of other companies that were selling to those companies and how, how much they charged and you know so if you can take that number and what you think the adoption rate is going to be and it's a reasonable adoption rate not large uh, you can start to uh, generate um, a a model of just how uh, what your revenue will look like that's reasonable um, and in their case, uh, because the number of uh, potential developers was so large, uh, the potential addressable market was very large, they showed a very profitable business. They were able to show a very profitable bu business without owning, you know, 5% market share in that space. So I don't, um, so here's, uh, here's a takeaway. Everyone expects you to go through that academic exercise. Your investors will. Uh, tell me how big your market is. Um, you know, but that's about it. You know, I don't, I don't put a lot more thought into, uh, you know, was that right? Was that nice? Great if Gartner covers the space and they say this is how big the market is. That's enough. You've done enough at that point. Um, but I think in general, most investors, and we as investors, will think about, okay, what's the persona that buys? Do I think there are a lot of them? And if there are, that's about as, that's about as much analysis as I need. Um, I think most investors are like that. To answer the question, okay. If you want help specifically, if you have a problem you're trying to solve, a market you're trying to solve, I'll put you in touch with somebody that's done that specific thing. Sure. Any other questions? Sure. True. Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, so uh, when you do, so product management, there's a thing called personas, and, and you think about uh, you know, who you're selling to. Are you selling to the CISO? Are you selling to, uh, you're selling to the, you know, the stock manager? Or are you selling to the analyst? Um, the scenario that I, you know, the problem that you're solving is the analyst. And it, well, in the scenario that I gave you, in other cases, if it's a risk management product, you're trying to help this individual communicate better to the C-suite, then a CISO is likely to really find the value in that. But, so this is how this works out. The, um, you know, take, take a, play, a page from the, the Splunk playbook. And we, a lot of our companies do this. Um, if you're really focused on making the, the analyst job easier or you know, making the SOC uh, more efficient or getting the guy home early and you're appealing to that emotion, um, then that will impact how you price. Uh, Splunk got that. They focused on that individual. Uh, they had a freemium that allowed, at a, at a small scale, that individual to, to get his job done early. Uh, and then that individual went and said to the other guys that were staying, like, you know, just use this. And then it got to the point where they were all continuing to use this particular tool because it's a great tool. Um, to do their to do their day job, and then all of a sudden, as they start to get to the end of that uh, that freemium license, you know they're part of the operation. Yeah. It's crack. Yeah. It is definitely a crack model. Okay. So okay. on that note, okay. thank you, to thank you. Rick for taking the time to talk to us. Thank you. Thanks for having me.